Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's session. Uh, we're just going to wait for two minutes so everybody can join. Um, so yeah, please hang on. Uh, we're now live, but uh, if you can just wait a couple of minutes and then then we'll get started. Thanks a lot. Hi again, everybody. Welcome to today's session. We're just going to wait for one extra minute. So uh, we get everybody joining in and then uh, we'll get started. So just one more minute. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Brick Real Estate Core Con 24. Um, hope you're all doing well out there. Uh, we're really excited for today's session. <clears throat> Lots to show you. Uh, it's been a lot of developments with Brick Schema and Real Estate Core, and we're uh, really excited to share those developments with you. So, Let's just start off with a look at today's agenda. So I'm just going to take you through uh, some uh, some practical things around what we're doing today. Obviously, the agenda, some housekeeping. I'm James McHale, by the way, from Memory Research. And then we're going to hand it over to Gabe and Carl, um, who are going to talk about the Brick 1.4 and Real Estate Core 4.1 releases. Then we're going to hand it over to Jason. He's going to talk about real life experiences from using Brick Schema and Real Estate Core and unlocking versatile use cases at the company Mapped. Then we're going to hand over to Eric and he's going to talk about the ecosystem of Brick and Real Estate Core. And of course, we're going to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, and that's going to be open to everybody, right? So uh, you can ask Gabe, Carl, Jason, Eric, uh, all questions you want, um, we'll be happy to take those. So the way you can do that, uh, if you look in your um, on your screen here, you should have a chat function. If you click on that, there is a public chat. So that's where I'm going to be going to find questions when we get to that portion of the event. Uh, so yeah, just feel free to uh, put those questions in when you think of them, um, and then we'll come to them later on. So just some housekeeping before we get started. Um, as I've said, um, asking questions in the chats pretty, should be pretty straightforward. Um, you can ask them at any time, and then we can get um, go through them later. Of course, we are uh, going to record this session today. And we're going to make uh, that recording available and also the presentations are going to be available after after the session as well. So you'll be able to find them at realestatecore.io brick recon 24. Um, and I'm sure if you've signed up, um, you will be sending you that link uh, when we finish today. So you're not going to hear much from me. I'm just going to give a little um, brief overview of why standards are needed. I think buildings are no longer um, just occupied with the predictability um, from that we had in the past. Um, and we lead, that's, of course, leading to fluctuations in energy usage, um, different space utilization patterns. 
and therefore uh, the tenants are requiring different things. Um, and we're also under pressure from regulations that are increasingly mandating uh, reduction in energy consumption and carbon emissions. Um, and that I think is compelling anyone who is op who is you know has a, is either a building owner or operator to optimize their operations um, for sustainability. Creating a common language for building data, um, of course, facilitates integration across different building systems. And I think by harnessing the power of data, we can more efficiently deliver services um, that help with optimizing buildings. So that's, of course, all the good stuff like building main uh, predictive maintenance, enhanced tenant experience, and of course, optimized energy management. Open data standards are helping to meet energy regulations. And in that context, I think Brick Schema and Real Estate Core have emerged as important tools in this space. They're allowing for the aggregation and analysis of energy usage data across entire portfolios of buildings, and they're providing the insights needed to drive energy saving measures and also to document compliance. By adopting data standards, we're not only future-proofing these assets in the face of, as I mentioned, regulations and, and shifting usage patterns, but also unlocking new use cases for technology. And I think that makes open data standards not just um, techn technically necessary now, but also a strategic imperative for future commercial buildings. So with all that in mind, um, that's sort of like the why we're here. Um, let's get on with some of the content. So I'm now going to hand over to Gabe and Carl. Guys, are you there? Here we are. I am. Yes. Hi. Good stuff. Um, okay. So I'll stop sharing and uh, you can put your slides up. Uh, great. So um, I'll start it off with a, a little bit of level setting about semantic metadata. Um, some of the things we're doing in Brick, talk about some of the work that Brick and Real Estate Core are doing for semantic interoperability with each other, as well as some of the other standards in the space. And then I'll hand it off um, to Carl to talk about some of the developments uh, in Real Estate Core. All right, so I'll double check, you can see the slides. Looks good. All right, wonderful. So just a little bit of level setting here to start. Um, Right, we want to build data-driven applications because there's so much data now available about buildings. Uh, but by and large, these applications require extensive configuration. Uh, you have to discover what data is there. You have to figure out what systems are there. Um, oftentimes, you have to wade your way through some sort of naming convention for the uh, uh, the BMS points. Um, the existing representations you have are not necessarily fit for for purpose. Um, it's harder to find the uh, uh, the data sources in your building management system uh, when all you have is the BIM model. Um, and so as a result, you, you, you have a lot of this manual site-specific configuration. And the value proposition of semantic metadata, things like Brick and Real Estate Core, um, Project Haystack, uh, ASHRAE 223P, is that they provide a common representation um, that's both human and machine readable, a common representation of, of building data points, their equipment, the subsystems, the architecture of the building, um, and the aim of this representation is to be a digital source that applications can go to, to more or less configure themselves, discover data, um, enabling automated reasoning and configuration of those applications and reducing the site-specific uh, configuration effort. Right, so uh, what do these graphs look like? So here's a highly simplified one, right, with a few rooms and a zone and, and some, uh, uh, some entities here with really just have names. We in associate types with these, um, right, these types would be from the brick and realistic core ontologies, and then we can associate uh, relationships in between uh, these entities that express how they relate to one another. You know, what are the points on this equipment? How is that equipment connected to other pieces of equipment? How does that relate to the architecture of the building, the HVAC zones, the rooms, the floors, um, and so on? Uh, and as that building gets more complicated, right, we care about the sensors and the actuators and the topology of these systems and the coils and where that water comes from and where that water goes and how the air flows through the spaces, um, those graphs also naturally get uh, you know, more complicated and more expressive um, and allow you to find data in terms of how that data source or that how that sensor relates to the operation of the building rather than the name of that, of that data source. 
OK, so hopefully um, that sort of refreshes your memory on uh, uh, the way that these semantic metadata models work. Of course, we have um, you know, emerging ways that applications can be written, um, and Jason will be talking a little bit about that later on as well. So what have we been working on um, in BRIC over the past year? So the BRIC 1.4 release candidate will be out for public review under a new tag on GitHub, um, either today or tomorrow, depending on um, when the last little uh, bug fix occurs. Uh, so watch out for a post for that in the Google group, um, which will also have a link to that, um, hopefully in uh, uh, the email that goes out after this. Um, the release candidate will contain the list of changes. It'll contain downloadable files for the release, example models, um, and over the next couple of weeks, you know, we asked for feedback from the community uh, on these. Um, you know, 1.3 was was October 2022, and we've had a lot of commits uh, to the main branch since then. Uh, so lots of things are changed. Um, uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of these are backwards compatible. Um, those will go over. So some new concepts uh, in Brook 1.4. Um, we have new sensors, set points, and commands. Uh, many of those uh, donated through generous efforts from uh, Mapped, uh, who will be speaking later on today, as well as the members of the Brick community. Um, adding in the ICT concepts from Real Estate Core, including sensor equipment um, for physical placement of, of sensors inside the model, which is something that we've been wanting to do for a while. Um, in addition to other things, we've got storage tanks, more photovoltaic systems, um, variable refrigerant fl flow, heat pumps, and chiller systems, the initial uh, uh, concepts for those are now inside Brick. Um, new terminal units, dampers, and pump concepts, as well as some uh, you know switch gear switches and breakers. Um, so please make sure you know if there's anything that's missing there, you know uh, uh, let it let us know. Um, we're pretty happy with the the number of concepts that have come in. There's been a lot of discussion on trying to model these things in 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 a halfway decent uh, manner, and I think I think we've done that. Um, another uh, uh, big change, 1.4, uh, are consistency fixes. So um, there's been, uh, at the beginning, uh, Brick tried to be more or less self-contained, uh, to be a sort of one-stop shop for all of your building data. Uh, as, as, as time has gone on, um, we're trying to work better with the rest of the, of the semantic web. So QUDT, or quantifiable units and data types, um, is an open source effort to uh, categorize uh, in an ontology units, quantity kinds, uh, and data types, as the standard name would suggest. Um, and the idea and and uh, uh, the ASHRAE 223P standard, which I'll talk a little bit uh, about later on, um, is also using this, um, this standard. And so it allows us to uh, have a common vocabulary for expressing what sensors are doing, what units a, a particular sensor is happens to be using. Um, uh, and so where we are in Brick 1.4 is um, we've basically removed the duplicate types that we had in Brick for that, and we're now using QUDT wherever possible. There's still a few Brick-only quantity kinds for HVAC, um, which we're going to try to remove or figure out a um, you know ways we push that into QDT over the next year. Um, this will give us greater consistency with the future ASHRAE uh, 223P standard. Um, we're also improving our use of Shackle for validation and inference. Um, I have a little bit of this uh, uh, later on in the slides, but essentially you can think of validation and inference as um, uh, uh, ways of making sure that you are using the ontologies correctly, uh, which is validation, and then ways of adding information that's implied by the statements you've put in your model, and that would be inference. And what these do is they allow greater um, compatibility between models because uh, you now have essentially the, the equivalent of the red squiggly line that appears under Word um, in in your Word document when you're when you're writing and you have a typo or a grammatic error. Um, An inference allows you to um, take allows downstream applications to take advantage of information that may not have been put explicitly in the model, uh, but can be determined automatically from the rules. What this also allows us to do um, is have future integration with ASHRAE 223P as well as integration with Project Haystack, um, which I'll talk about later on, um, as well as compatibility with Real Estate Core, which I'll talk about uh, in just a moment. Um, we now have quantity and substance annotations for sensor set points uh, and commands. Um, so now it's easier to figure out what's going on with those. You don't just have to look at the name of the class. Um, we've rearranged many of these class trees so they are more consistent um, and the naming makes a lot more sense. 
Um, and thanks a whole lot to uh, to Mapped for for their generous effort in helping us do that. Um, and of course, you know, please see the release notes for for other details. A couple other modeling concepts in Brick 1.4. Um, we have uh, a number of duplicate things, so variable air volume box and VAV. Uh, so now we have an, a, an annotation inside Brick, um, uh, which which uh, identifies the preferred class name. So variable air volume box would be preferred over VAV. This just helps you normalize the naming of of, of things within the ontology. Um, again, you don't have to change anything about the way that you're modeling. This is sort of just handled automatically uh, through Shackle. Um, we now have you know, improved handling of deprecated classes and concepts. So if something does, for instance, the location classes in Brick um, in the 1.4 release, those are going over the core. Um, and so now uh, Brick will help sort of fix your model to the best uh, uh, that it can um, if you are using a concept that's no longer um, existing. Um, it's easier to extend Brick, of course, alignment with real estate core, um, and we've laid the groundwork for future alignment with Ashray 223P. Okay, so really briefly on easier extensions. Um, writing Turtle and RDF in the semantic web world can be um, a little confusing. Um, and so in the Brick repository, rather than asking you to um, figure out how to write one of these um, ontologies yourself or figure out how to use an ontology authoring tool, um, what you can do, and this, this is example files in the Brick repository right now, um, it's essentially just write some Python code um, and if you just follow the structure we have in this Python code here, um, so here you can see examples of adding new equipment here, adding new entity properties like manufacturers and versions. If you just write this dictionary, um, you can uh, uh, just compile your extension to the Brick ontology or the Real Estate Core ontology just using um, the existing uh, 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 the existing tooling that's in the repository. So hopefully a little bit easier to write those extensions. Um, and it will get you know compiled into the same documentation structure. Um, okay, so now um, so the, the next few things are, are all steps towards uh, semantic interoperability um, that we've been doing in Brick 1.4. First off, so for Brick and Real Estate Core, um, uh, Carl will go over a little bit over the specifics of um, you know uh, uh, what's what's changed in Real Estate Core. But the way that we can essentially think about this is most of the location stuff. The location stuff has moved to real estate core and more of the equipment and point stuff has moved into brick. So how do we get these to be more or less compatible? Um, there's a file called brick patches, which is in the brick repository um, that's been worked on by, by both teams. This is a, essentially a, a set of, of shackle uh, rules that are interpreted by uh, a piece of software called a, a, a shackle reasoner. There's open and closed source uh, commercial implementations of that. Um, and what this does is the hard work of making sure that Brick and Real Estate Core are used uh, uh, together correctly. And this gives us more or less automated backwards compatibility uh, for moving your existing models into the sort of hybrid Brick and Real Estate Core world. So on the left, we have this last known value relationship, which was added to Brick that allows you to encode a value of a, a time series point or BMS point that's inside the model. Um, and Real Estate Core wants an observation type that lets you know what kind of um, you know, reading this is. And so here on the right is an example of one of the rules that says, hey, if there's a temperature sensor and it's got a last known value, that last known value um, is a temperature observation. And there's a rule that will make sure that that um, annotation gets put into the model correctly for you. Um, on the left are a couple examples of the, of the, uh, uh, the rules that will replace the location types automatically. Um, so in Brick, we had a location types and Realistic Core had location types. And so moving together, Brick in Brick, we are deprecating these location types and moving them all over to Real Estate Core. So some of the names have changed very slightly. Um, however, you don't need to know this. Your modelers don't need to know this. You just run it through the shackle process um, and all the correct types will be added for you. In addition, on the right, the uh, the properties and relationships in Real Estate Core um, uh, will be added when when uh, when needed to make sure that the vocabularies are, are are unified. So what might this look like? So on the left is a very basic brick model that would be compliant with brick 1.3. It has a brick building, brick floors containing brick zones, um, and using brick relationships to relate those. Now most of these are moving over to real estate core. So how might we do that translation? Um, so the code is on the right here. 
Um, we're basically just loading in an ontology environment that allows us to discover all the dependencies, discovering the real estate core ontology and pulling that in so the reasoner can use that. We create a graph uh, object and load in our model and the brick release candidate. Uh, we import the dependencies like real estate core, we perform inference, and then we can run the validation on the graph um, and then save the resulting graph. And so what the resulting graph looks like is we can see that floor one is now also a real estate core story in addition to a, a, a floor. Um, the brick building, uh, building one is a real estate core building in addition to a brick building and uh, everything else is a rec zone in addition to a brick zone. Um, and it's not showed here for uh, just to not have too much text on this slide. Uh, but the validation report lets you know that you're using brick concepts like zone and building and floor um, that should be moved entirely over to real estate core. So it fixes your model and lets you know what you can fix uh, going forward. All right, so um, I'm not going to say a whole lot on there's a, a, a whole other talk that I could give on the work that we're doing here. Um, Project Haystack um, is working on a type system. Uh, to help bring some uh, uniformity to the way that haystack models are created. Um, what this does is it offers us in the, in the RDF world uh, an opportunity to have uh, more formal translations with uh, Project Haystack. So as part of um, funding from, uh, with funding from the Department of Energy um, in my role at NREL, we're currently working on um, essentially an implementation of this new haystack, uh, this new haystack concept in Shackle in RDF that allows us to automatically produce valid haystack models from brick and real estate core models, as well as 223P models. So if you have brick or real estate core, um, someday soon you will be able to automatically derive a haystack model from that. Um, and to some extent, you'll also be able to validate a, an existing haystack model against 223P brick and real estate core um, uh, just by going the other way. So. Again, this is still under active development, um, nothing that's really ready to be demoed, but um, we're, we're pretty confident in this direction and we're really excited about uh, the opportunities it's gonna afford us all in bringing all of these efforts uh, closer together. In terms of Brick and, real, and 223P, the core and Haystack, um, 223P will be coming out for a public release sometime in the next couple of weeks. Um, the ASHRAE conference, um, is uh is happening uh this weekend and, and next week uh and so keep an eye out for the public release of the ashray 223p um standard so what does that mean for brick and real estate core well brick and real estate core are more or less the human facing application vocabulary on top of a very detailed and low level semantic model provided by 223p and haystack could be one possible high level abstraction over the rdf and graph models if you think of 223P maybe as sort of your machine code that's running on your CPU, maybe brick and real estate core are like your C++, then Haystack might be something like your basic or your JavaScript sitting on top, right? Maybe a little bit easier to use, but not necessarily as expressive as what's going on underneath. Um, and again, this is not fully ready yet, but we have the groundwork laid in 1.4 for this type of um, automatic derivation of higher level models on top of 223P. Um, and we're really excited about, about that direction. So just giving you a little preview of what might be going on inside the 223P stuff. Um, I know here the damper and the heating coil are backwards. I didn't realize that until after I put together the figure, but please bear with me. So something like 223P, um, it's not just the, the, the assets there, it's also the connection points and the substances and the directionality and the connections themselves of how these components relate to one another and your sensor observing properties, and those are properties are associated with these things. So, you know, if I just want to have a, a know where my, say, differential pressure sensor is, I might just use Brick or Real Estate Core to, to ask which equipment has a differential pressure sensor. But if I want to know where are the two places in the model where that differential pressure sensor is actually measuring uh, between, I would need something like 223P um, to provide me that level of detail. Brick and Real Estate Core, you know, sort of giving you this much uh, higher level application facing view, um, a simplification of 223P with more specific names and, and names that are closer to what you might actually talk about when you're talking about applications. Um, and again, we're working on programmatically generating this graph model from the much more detailed and richer uh, graph model in 223P. 
And then something like Haystack would be able to add these tags to each of those. So you could almost use this like keyword search or a Google search on top of your, your building. And again, all of this, where we're heading is all of this could be programmatically derived. So Haystack from Brick and Real Estate Core. And if you wanted to, Brick and Real Estate Core models from an underlying 223P model. Um, okay, so that's a little bit on um, you know, where we're going with these standards. Uh, what does it look like for um, using these standards to actually go and build applications? So one step we're taking um, is trying to figure out uh, how might I, as a uh, as a customer um, of of a company, or how might how might I, as a as a uh, as a firm, make sure that a semantic metadata model actually contains the information required to go and build an application? So here from Ashlight Guideline Thirty Six, right? So these are sequences of operation for high performance forced air systems. I have a list of words that describe the data sources that I need. Um, there's sort of a description of a system um, that this sequence of operations is used for. Um, but how might I actually require the brick or real estate core model to contain the right metadata, right? When this is delivered to you as a customer or when you're delivering this model, how do you make sure this contains the right stuff? Um, and so this is what we're using. One thing that you can use Shackle for. So Shackle is a W3 standard that defines shapes, which you can think of as just functions that return true or false when evaluated on a graph. So my shape might say, for my cooling only VAV, this particular sequence of operations needs exactly one zone air temperature sensor and at most one uh, temperature set point. Obviously, this is a simplified example. I take my model um, representing my building. I feed that into this validation function and I get as the output some report that says, um, for instance, here, well, you have a set point, which was optional, um, but you were missing the mandatory temperature sensor. So you need to go and model that. You need to go and add that to the model um, in some sort of way. Uh, and so this is, and ends up being a really, really rich basis on which to build your, your applications because you now have the ability to actually check um, did I do things correctly? And not just correctly, but did I also make sure that I contained sufficient information in my model to support a desired set of applications? The other thing we're working on is, is templates, which you can think of as just functions that generate graphs. Um, so here might be a simple template that generates a VAV with some sensors and set points and a damper and a damper position command. Um, rather than having to worry about how to actually express all of that in Turtle, um, I might just have a table of input that can generate as many of these VAVs that I want for my building and do so in a consistent way. Um, I can pull this information from web forms or spreadsheets or maybe from backnet networks. Um, and the idea of a template is something that generalizes not just to brick, but real estate core, also 223P. So eventually these models will get much, much easier to build. You don't really have to deal with the RDF stuff itself. Um, and uh, the product or the, the, the project that we are wrapping this into, so this is part of my work um, at, with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, um, building motif um, is essentially a, a, an open source SDK that allows you to incorporate these end use requirements into an iterative workflow that helps you make sure that these meta, metadata models are um, contain sufficient metadata to support downstream applications, make sure that they're correct with respect to those standards. Um, as well as help automate and simplify the authoring of those of those models. Um, this is all open source. Um, it's available on GitHub, and it currently supports Brick, Real Estate Core, and 223P. And we're hoping to add support for Project Haystack uh, at some point this year. So hopefully, um, so you may need to refer to the recording uh, to get to get some of the details there. Um, uh, hopefully, those slides will be at least a nice reference. Go ahead. Super, thanks. Uh, so James, I think my slides are in the Google Sheet. So could you share that? Sure, will do. Uh, thank you, Gabe. Um, super interesting uh, evolution there, particularly as pertains to the automatic or semi-automatic mapping from uh, lower level representations all the way up to, uh, I like the, the uh, programming language analogy, good one. Uh, so real estate core, um, if brick comes at it from the um, 
from the representation of these systems and points, as Gabe covered, primarily um, that's the, where the weight lies, so to speak. Um, the equipment that is mounted inside the building real estate core comes at it from a real estate owner point of view and also covers things like spatial relations, uh, like organizational relations, um, and uh, basically the utilization of the building from a real estate owner point of view. Um, includes things like furniture and, and uh, um, who owns or rents the parts of the building and, and so forth. And, a more administrative type of things. Um, that is not uh, that that has a relatively mature space, and uh, not to say we don't have reason to add things, particularly in relation to the alignment with Brick. Uh, but we haven't seen as much evolution over the past year since our last release as Brick has seen. So the uh, update list is comparatively short. So we've added some rooms uh, that uh, to support the Brick. Um, brick spaces that are being deprecated on the brick side to ensure that we still have, as a union, uh, the functionality that will be needed. Um, adding some um, some parameters for wiring up these buildings against systems like Microsoft IoT Hub, for instance, or other uh, systems. Uh, for compatibility with how, um, how brick handles systems, uh, Real Estate Core used to define that a system could only include uh, things that were, if I recall correctly, equipments. Um, and so that actually meant that some ways of modeling systems and loops that were valid in BRIC were not valid in real estate course. So we are relaxing that inclusion uh, criteria for what's included in a system. Um, and similarly, uh, removing some uh, requirements that were on, on assets, like the fact they had to be located in at least one place. Sometimes, I mean, Physically, they're always located in a place, obviously. An asset has a location. But sometimes you don't know where, and it could still be valuable from a modeling point of view to represent that asset. And so if we previously had to go and create sort of fake spaces just to put our assets in, well, you don't have to do that any longer. Um, there's a bug fix on the photovoltaic panel uh, in a um, representation in, in Real Estate Core. And, um, also, simple relabeling of is member of to member of for agents to be more compliant with how W3C organization ontology uh, does it. And that's by simply we deprecating the older one. The older one will still work until the next breaking release. Um, uh, so we can move to the next slide, Jim. So this is basically shows on a very high level where brick and real estate core jack into one another so to speak so and this by the way the all the blue makes it seem as if real estate core is a lot larger than brick that's not the case brick is a lot deeper and more nested in terms of the content that brick has and covers um but on the top level uh concepts um as you see brick has things like equipment which we subclass from real estate core assets so we're saying anything that is a brick equipment is a real estate core asset Real Estate Core also has other types of assets, things like furniture and uh, architectural barriers like doors and whatnot. Um, Real Estate Core has, as I mentioned, organizations and persons and the relations that hold between organizations and persons and ownership of buildings and so forth. Um, has building elements, the, the physical building elements of the building, walls, slabs, facade, balconies, etc. Uh, collections, which are an administrative grouping, I suppose, in a sense, uh, that can include physical or, or non-physical content. So the collections that are in real estate core are things like apartment, which would be a collection of rooms, or a campus, which would be in a collection of buildings, or a portfolio, which likewise is a collection of buildings but might not be physically located at one site like a campus is. But we then pull in uh, brick collections as a subclass of that. So brick loops are, if you think of it, collections of equipment or, or well, things that are going to make up loops. Uh, brick systems and brick photovoltaic arrays are all collections of other, well, brick or potentially real estate core phenomena. But I think those are presently a brick phenomena. Real estate core has events, the point of that being things like we can model leases as an event which has a duration, or we can say that a sensor reading is an event that's a subclass from point event there. Real estate core has information, but these are purely uh, non-tangible things, things like geo-references or geometries or documents or points of interest. 
that you can use to tag up your model with something to support a business use case relevant to a real estate owner. Then we have the brick points, which there's no sort of super hierarchy for that in the real estate core space. So they are, that, that's grafted on to real estate core as a top level concept. And those are your brick alarms, commands, parameters, set, sensors, set points, and status, which are you well known to you if you're using brick. Uh, and then we have the root uh, phenomenon space, which is the uh, where we ground locations and, and spatial relations. So here we have things like regions, which could be you know arbitrarily large region, it could be Europe, or it could be uh, Washington State, uh, or, or it could be the Amazon, or whatever. Um, but then we also have what we call architecture, which are constructed spaces, and subclusters of that include things like sites, buildings, levels, rooms, etc. Um, and they can all have, of course, relations to agents who own them or to one another in terms of topologies. So levels are part of, of uh, or rooms are part of levels, which are parts of buildings, that kind of thing. Um, now, the green arrows here denote some examples, and there are more, but those are just the ones I picked up immediately, of where these hierarchies or where, where brick and real estate core interweave functionally. So we'll say, for instance, that brick points are typically assigned to real estate core spaces in many cases. You um, or to, um, well, they could of course be um, tied directly to brick equipment. But you may want to abstract away and say that this room has a temperature sensor tied to it. That's not an uncommon use case. Physically, that may be a sensor that's mounted somewhere. But from a real estate modeling point of view, when I'm I'm trying to build a system that does something with this, I may not always need to know exactly how it's mounted. So I can just say that there's a temperature tied to this room or to this level or, or whatever. Um, all of those uh, documents and georeferences and geometries, all that information um, can, of course, also be tied to things like brick equipment um, or um, uh, the events that I mentioned, the point event uh, sub hierarchy. If we want to represent actual sensor readings as first order representations in our knowledge graph, that could be a sensor uh, event which has a timestamp and a value. And that's tied, of course, to a source point where this event emanated from. Um, so uh, at the end of the day, what you end up having is, is the union of the two ontologies that are uh, that is interweaved if you will hierarchically in terms of subsumption and in terms of relationships um, if we move to the next slide so this would be an example uh, from our docs on how that might look um, so all the blue things here are spaces i think um, and the green things are uh, mostly equipment with the exception of or their assets, real estate core assets. Four of those assets, uh, the luminaire on the bottom left, and the AHU, the VAV, and the damper are, I believe, brick concepts. And the orange boxes there are uh, points assigned to some of those concepts, and those are also brick. So you'll see that, that we connect up phenomena from these two different models in a way to support whatever use case we may have. Um, moving on to the next slide, please. Um, and so if you go to the real estate core docs, uh, and I'm sure the similarly, if you go to the brick docs, I only copied screenshots off of the real estate core docs. We actually have uh, a list of the hierarchy of the ontology on the left hand side there. And that's on dev.realestatecore.io and you click on ontology and you'll get uh, um, a view of this hierarchy. And you'll see both the real estate core and the brick phenomena in that documentation at this point. And if we look on the right hand side here, you'll see this is an example of the brick fire safety equipment as exposed through the real estate core docs. Um, and if you were, and, and that includes child interfaces and relationships and so forth. Uh, and that will be completely interweaved with and interlinked with the real estate core docs about relating phenomena or parent or child phenomena. Um, moving to the next slide, please. Also, how we package this for release. This is a little bit uh, up in the air at the moment because we are just waiting on, on again, on Brick 1.4 to drop and subsequently on Real Estate Core 4.1 to actually execute our release pipelines to actually uh, get to, to something we can ship. 
But what we actually do on, on the real estate core side is, um, I know this sort of runs counter to the semantic web ideals where you're supposed to just link out, but for consistency, we, we actually keep a copy of brick, uh, a compiled copy of brick in our repo as well. So on the left-hand side there, you'll see that we have under source, we have DTDL models for digital twin definition language, which is the native real estate core uh, language. We also have the shackle models and we have a copy of brick uh, cloned into our repo there so that you know that this is a uh, the consistent version that we worked at with. And this at the moment would be brick 1.3. Once we have 1.4, of course, we'll put that there and update uh, everything. Uh, similarly, if you go to uh, the bricks uh, Git ontology, uh, Git repo on the right hand side, you'll find some alignment documents there uh, as well uh, under the alignments subdirectory. Um, so basically, these are these can be viewed jointly in documentation. They can be, they are are hosted as as guests, if you will, in one another's Git repositories, and uh, are built basically to work uh, together. Uh, let's see. And I think that's the last bit I had for me uh, for now. So I think we're ready to move on to to Jason. <clears throat> Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate that detailed look at Brick and Real Estate Core and where we are at the moment. So, yeah, Jason, why don't you join us? How are you doing? I think I'll just going to share. There we go. Yeah. Good stuff. So, Jason, are you going to <clears throat> present your own slides, or would you, do you want me yeah, to? I'm going to present my own slides. Great stuff. So, yeah, if you go ahead, then uh, can get going. Thanks. Okay. Do you see my screen well? Hello. Just just to double check my screen share. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, see. we can see. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jason Ko, Chief Data Officer at Mac, and thank you, Gabe and Carr, for presenting the recent changes and updates at Brick and Real Estate Core. I'm really glad that we joined the force uh, and focus on uh, expert areas by each communities, and uh, happy to help. Happy to uh, have all the words. And uh, I tweaked the title a little bit more um, <clears throat> uh, while I was preparing the slides. Uh, that I I found that. Uh, it is important for uh, me to share my experiences in terms of the ontologies, why we chose Brick and Real Estate Core for our core ontology and uh, what enabled uh, on our side. And this talk will be a, a more uh, high level helicopter view of how we use, how we use it and uh, why the ontology uh, of Brick and Real Estate Core uh, was useful for us, uh, good for us. Um, and uh, let's dive in. So let me summarize what Mac does first before uh, diving into what uh, the uh, what the ontology effect does. Uh, we ingest all the different types of data available in buildings, such as building systems as BACnet, Modbus, KNX, and so on, um, as well as other IoT systems like occupant sensing devices or air quality sensors or even calendar systems so that you can uh, use Mac as a holistic system data layer for uh, implementing your own applications with, uh, for your buildings. Uh, after we ingest, uh, automatically ingest all the data into our platform, uh, we store them in uh, Brick and Real Estate Core and output the data in different models uh, such as GraphQL or Webhooks SparkLab based on your uh, application's uh, purposes. Our GraphQL is our primary API, but uh, there are other streaming APIs that you can uh, 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 egress uh, uh, more real-time data as well. If you uh, want to unlock the potential of the data immediately, you can also, we also provide connectors uh, to push the data in your buildings into other analytical platforms, such as digital team platforms or uh, walk order systems or BI, uh, BI tools and so on. Um, so there are so, uh, there are so many different uh, ways to utilize the data, but we provide it uh, in a single uh, unified format. 
So why MEP chose Brigham Real Estate Core uh, as our core ontology? Uh, of course, uh, I mean, it, it was a no-brainer for me as a co-creator of Brick Schema, uh, but there are other practical reasons why we chose it. First, uh, the Brigham Real Estate Core uh, inherently is a graph model that naturally makes sense. When you think about your own building, you think about it as a graph, actually. Uh, there's a VAB uh, fitting into my room uh, where uh, temperature sensors exist, where uh, people, uh, you know, do work, uh, and that VAB may be controlled by an AHU. Uh, Gabe and Carl both share the graph graphic concept of the buildings. And also, uh, both of them are, uh, ad ad has adopted a hierarchical type system uh, uh, since the beginning. So it is very extensible to your own purposes, and I'm going to show how it uh, it affects our uh, use cases uh, down, uh, later on. And also, uh, it is an open standard, and it is designed to be uh, interoperable with all the other ontologies. Um, so for us, for us as a platform to serve any any customer's needs, it is a no-brainer to choose you know interoperable uh, ontology. Um, so to talk about uh, the choice of, uh, you know, why Graph is such an important part for us, I have to talk about what GraphQL is. Uh, GraphQL is our uh, primary API for customers to use the data. Uh, it is a query language. Uh, in a GraphQL, a client can define uh, what they exactly want, and the server side, us, uh, can gather the exact data to respond to that uh, uh, query instead of uh, gathering all the data and uh, dumping into the customer so that uh, the customer can uh, filter out uh, the unuseful data. So it is useful for uh, large and relational data like buildings. Um, so it, it has been a, a success. It has been successful for our customers. Uh, they can easily understand the, uh, the API and uh, access the data. Uh, you can see uh, how how we how we use it in this link. Uh, in the, in the summary, something like a GraphQL engine uh, it has a middle layer that may have access to uh, different types of the internal databases uh, like building structures, time series, and uh, people databases, uh, so to say. We can define a very specific uh, query uh, to pull the data, and in this case, you are interested in spaces and points. Uh, and they are time series data. Um, so the engine understands the uh, uh, query and access the, uh, pull the data from the exact databases and return uh, the output. Um, as you can imagine, uh, what I just said is exactly aligned to uh, Brick and Realistic Core's uh, graph model. So this is a very simplified version of uh, one uh, building. A building has part floor, has which has a zone, which has a room, uh, zone is fed by BAB and has point uh, and so on. If you write a query to get a temperature sensor in a certain zone, uh, it may look like this. Uh, uh, it, they, uh, you, you can get what, whatever buildings you want, and then you can get whatever floors you want, and then zones and points and more details about the points and so on. So it is very versatile. Why it is it is a, it is a type system uh, that is reliable uh, that you can uh, uh, write your own applications against. So I said the graph is uh, very natural to what we percept the build how we percept the buildings. So you can quite like your like talking uh, with a graphical schema uh, of ours. So let's say that we have we want to retrieve all the comment points that are located in the first floor. You can say that, give me the floors uh, whose level is zero uh, and a specified type of the comment of the points. This is a very simple example. It can be a little more complicated uh, with the notion of the how building is configured. Uh, so I want to get AHU1 um, and uh, who is fitting a certain BABs, which is abstracted in this query, which is fitting a zone, uh, which it has, which is part of the spaces. Um, so 
Uh, the downside of GraphQL is, you know, you have to understand the schema to write the exact query. Uh, so once you get used to it, it is very natural. Uh, you can translate whatever you think in uh, in your in your in your mind into a query. Uh, but for uh, newcomers or non-developers, sometimes it is pretty challenging to write GraphQL query yourself. So what we decided to what we decided to, addition, in addition to our very nice uh, GraphQL schema with the ontology alignment, is Maps GPT, uh, which is supports uh, graph, automatic GraphQL generation from prompts. Um, I mean, it is already 2024. I cannot skip the presentation without talking about large language models. <laughs> uh, those are uh, trained over a large set of the, uh, large set of text, and they can generate a text or uh, these days more than just a text uh, based on an input prompt and they can consume a, also very long input prompt to make something very useful. How is it aligned to uh, the goal of GraphQL generation from prompts? Um, you can let the model, the L, an LLM model like, like OpenAI's GPT-4 be aware of our schema and also help understand uh, which helps uh, uh, them to understand uh, the user intent. And we can engineer the prompts. Uh, this is so-called a prompt engineering uh, so that uh, we, uh, the model can output what we desire uh, to see uh, based on the input. Um, this is available in our developer portal. Uh, you can try, try yourself if you have a sample data, uh, very realistic data. Uh, and then you can uh, write your own query and then uh, see what outputs uh, from your uh, from the data uh, underlying uh, whose underlying ontology is big and realistic for. Um, so it, it is a better, better version for now, uh, but you know, please test the limit uh, and let me know your experiences. Uh, happy to help you in any directions. So because uh, because the brick and real estate core uh, follows the graph model, very natural, uh, we were able to write a graph real schema and uh, in addition to that, uh, easily generate uh, automated uh, graph queries out of human prompts. So your interaction with the building became more natural. Uh, and I'm going to talk about extensibility a little more. Um, I work with actual customers uh, who have uh, sometimes come up with uh, very new concepts like heat pumps. I mean, heat pumps has been an old concept, but it recently has been popularized much more. Uh, but uh, there is no standard fully uh, model uh, who fully model uh, the concept of heat pumps just yet. Uh, there are many activities, but it, they are not uh, finalized yet. Also, uh, if you look into actual uh, control you know, systems and control logic, there can be very strict points uh, necessary for controls and also necessary for uh, certain customers' use cases. Also, uh, some customers want to bring uh, new types of data, uh, such as work orders, uh, which is an essential part of the building operations, and uh, they want to model those. And uh, the existing ontologies uh, sometimes do not cover those cases. Um, and because Brig and Realistic adopts the class hierarchy or hierarchical type system. Uh, we can easily extend those, and uh, while it is, it, it can support new concepts. Uh, while uh, it is compatible uh, with the existing uh, types and existing applications, uh, let's say that uh, we have a very simple hierarchy as equipment uh, is a parent of HVAC equipment, which is a, a <coughs> parent of damper and terminal unit. We recently encountered the concept of zone tempers, uh, which is pretty common, but we uh, just haven't modeled it yet in our, in our existing ontologies yet. Uh, so we introduced the concept of zone damper as a subclass of both uh, damper and terminal unit. So while uh, zone damper is, has not been standardized in the ontology just yet, um, by modeling this uh, as a subclass of both uh, damper and terminal unit, it will be compatible with other applications for tempo analysis or tumbling for associating that with a specific zone uh, with other uh, end users. Um, so MAP uh, uh, 
Yeah, that's just what I said. Uh, by this way, we are we were able to streamline contribution to, con uh, our contributions to Brick and Realistic Core. Whenever we meet new customers, uh, they demand uh, you know uh, their needs because I mean they they, they have they have a right to do it because we're supposed to support uh, their needs. Uh, and sometimes that comes in days. And standard version release is relatively slow, like in months, because it needs to be uh, perfect, uh, the finalized and the agreed upon ac across the community uh, and check if there's any bug and so on. So we adopted this model that if we introduce a new terminology, uh, we mark it as an experimental inside our internal uh, uh, ontology. And then uh, stage that experimental uh, concept to break as an issue or pull request to gather the feedback. And once it is official uh, at break uh, in the release or it is approved uh, <coughs> uh, into uh, the main branch, uh, we mark it as official at break and we more widely use it so that the customers distinguish those uh, three, like whether it's experimental, uh, whether it is uh, in the process of the standardization and so on. Uh, somehow, uh, if it is not adopted by Brick for uh, or Rest Decor in different uh, many different reasons, uh, because the concept is, is you know too narrow or not widely used, or it is uh, we model it that way, we model uh, they model it this way, and so on. And then we can uh, make it as uh, an official in our internal ontology, so that the customers can uh, uh, maintain the backward compatibility. Um, this way. Um, uh, we have more than 26 pull requests um, and also contributed many discussions at Brick uh, in the upcoming versions and also two issues uh, to improve the real estate core. And also we are expanding uh, the domains of those ontologies. Uh, I briefly talked about the new system uh, in the first slide of this section, uh, <clears throat> uh, but both uh, Brick and real estate core are not not perfect i mean uh, there's no ontology that can model the entire world uh, at once so we introduce new concepts one by one and we found that the access control systems is such a critical system for building optimizations and there can be various use cases such as people counting security enhancement uh, which involves introducing many new different concepts uh, we we have introduced in, uh, in our uh, map inside uh, as an experimental of uh, access control zones and entry uh, controlled by access control unit and so on. And we put, uh, uh, we summarize our findings to this pull request. Uh, and uh, since then we have we have a lot uh, we have a lot of development and uh, the, the model has been pretty stabilized with actual uh, uh, tested against actual use cases and customers but please express your opinions and I will follow up more uh, in this uh, thread. Walkwater Systems is uh, another domain that uh, we have supported uh, for uh, several customers in the uh, last year. Uh, Walkwaters are, again, uh, critical for operations. Uh, if, you, if you have a fault, uh, you report it to, uh, you uh, issue a ticket so that it can be fixed if there's a water uh, water leak or if there's co coffee fit uh, uh somebody dropped the coffee uh, we have to clean it up um, so there are a lot of human involvement in the process so we want to uh, so some customers wanted to automate the process of that and analyze uh, why it happened and what affected and so on uh, so we have introduced the concept of walk orders people events and so on a walk order can be related to a certain type of equipment, uh, which has an assignee who is going to fix it. Uh, and there are many other details about this. And uh, our proposal will be coming soon. And given that uh, it, is really, it is somewhat related to events, uh, I, I'd like to discuss more on this with a uh, realistic core, probably. Um, those are actual case uh, case studies uh, we did with our customers for certain uh, you know domains. So I talked about uh, <clears throat> access control systems. So there was a, a 
foresters building in Asia who wanted to integrate their building systems. And one of the core use cases was to uh, gather uh, the access control systems, uh, card reader data to estimate the occupants per floor. They didn't have any uh, occupancy sensors, but uh, they were able to estimate the numbers only using the access card readers uh, to support other operations such as meal preparation at the cafeteria and so on. Um, and they were uh, able to uh, uh, build a POC a dashboard and then they're uh, moving forward to productizing. And also uh, there are, uh, there was a, a a healthcare provider who has 150, uh, more than 150 hospitals uh, who wanted to automate uh, workforder management uh, and they were able to, uh, they, uh, they estimate to save a lot of money on this. And also uh, they were able to pour uh, their buildings into uh, their uh, application, which was struggling to deploy across the portfolio uh, by adopting our ontology based uh, service uh, data at map. Um, so yeah, the extensibility allowed us to support any types of use cases that our customers want. And I think uh, that uh, I'm spending most of the time. So let me be quick about the last one and because Gabe and Carl already talked about it. Um, because it is an open standard, uh, uh, it is interoperable with other uh, ontologies, Project Haystack and Google Digital Buildings Ontology and Azure DTDL were not mentioned today yet but it, those are also uh, widely used in uh, different regions. Uh, so we are supporting all those cases uh, by translating our ontology into, and the data model into uh, whatever the customers need. So this is our white paper about it. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Gabe talked about this more, uh, but this is uh, prior to uh, the engine get, that Gabe is developing. Um, but it is more real basic. And we also have software implementation of running Haystack server on top of Map API um, so that the Haystack applications don't have to, you know, rewrite the applications for Map. This is open source, uh, so you can see uh, how it looks like or uh, improve, uh, you know, request features uh, or leave, leave questions there. Yeah, because we stick to uh, we stick to a brick and real estate core, we were able to support any other ontologies the customers need. And everything that I showed is uh, you can test it out our at our website. All the codes are. Uh, let me know if you can can I find any resources. I can give you a chance. Thank you. James. Yeah, I'm back. That's great. Thanks so much, Jason. Right. Let's switch over to the other deck, although I can't seem to do that. Um, and we can bring Eric in, I believe, right? Here Let are. me see. Yes. Hi. Can you see and hear me, Jim? I can, yeah. Excellent. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit of the of, of, of the of the of the why of uh, why we are doing why we're doing these efforts. Uh, I mean, I think we've gotten excellent presentations from 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 uh, Gabe, Carl, and Jason. Uh, I mean, explaining both the kind of backgrounds, but also a little bit what is what is new and updated. I think it was excellent, Jason. I mean, to see also who you practically use this. Uh, also, how you can extend um, the ontologies and, and, and map and, and, and map to the others. So, Jim, if you can take the next slide. <coughs> so, I will just, I will just, I will just repeat. Why are we doing this? I mean, uh, you can. I mean, uh, of course, if you are a property owner, commercial or public property owner, uh, I mean, you 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 want to. Uh, you, you you want to stream you want to make your operation more efficient you want to save energy and you want to to um, facilitate uh, different uh, i mean uh, maintenance operations and 
I mean, what we what we're really trying to do when we have been looking at this is that is that we try to make the buildings, uh, I mean, make them into in, into the good inhabitants of the smart city, putting APIs on the buildings so they can interact with with all the other other parts in the smart city, the smart uh, society, and. Of course, now there is a, a, a big focus uh, all around the globe on, on sustainability. And as you probably know, there's this number, 40% of all energy is being consumed within, uh, within buildings. Um, and that number that is, that is floating around, uh, uh, whether, uh, whether, whether it's accurate or not, uh, there, there's lots of energy being consumed in buildings. And of course, there is as you can see uh, and as you probably have experience from that can you just tune your buildings a little bit better you can do uh, quite large savings uh, quite rapidly but then of course imagine if you could interconnect all different systems i think it's one of the first time when i met gabe <clears throat> i think you referred to one of your first grants i think it was from the department of energy in the us uh, which had come to the conclusion that in order to to achieve the energy savings, systems need to talk to each other, and in order to talk to each other, they need to speak the same language. Uh, you can jump to the next slide, Jim, please. So, if you try to <clears throat> put some numbers to this, <clears throat> I mean, here are here are some numbers, and you. We will share the slide deck later so you can get to see the references. But here is McKinsey and Al that has tried to make some calculation about the value of of of, of the uh, of the smart buildings and or IoT as they used to refer, refer to it many times. And as you can see, it's huge numbers. It's hard to grasp uh, how, how 480 billions and if it's if if it's uh, if it's right or not. But but I think the two interesting points that uh, that McKinsey and Al is pointing to that the kind of blockers are interoperability. Uh, I mean, we have data in silos systems. I mean, uh, and also the scalability. Not just that systems should be able to talk to each other, but it also needs to be able to scale. You probably are all familiar with kind of signature buildings that that uh, property owners has they have a couple of signature buildings that that they have put in all um, all all the measurable uh, high tech or, or technology in and and you can make wonderful use cases and really cool buildings but it's usually very expensive to scale that out to your portfolio of hundreds or thousands of buildings so the kind of major problems is 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 uh, is the uh, interoperability which we are addressing with the standards but also the scalability which also points to uh, my interpretation that we also need to make sure that the api works together that gets some sort of https uh, http or https for 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 the buildings uh, something similar and this is of course I mean, the kind of reason of for why real estate core and brick schema uh, that also has been working very much with our friends in Haystack and our friends in in in, in Ashray 223P as well as our uh, building topology ontology group uh, that consists of lots of uh, BIM savvy uh, persons uh, um, in in this case, and uh, I mean, so we. As we see it, is that we 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 have this uh, this solution, and we're also trying to. You probably seen the the, the uh, you probably seen lots of different kinds of comic uh, drawings about uh, how engineers such as myself is 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 uh, is, is uh, exploring different standards, and not no one no one suits. So I'll, we will make a new one. I'll make a new one, and. I think, of course, we have been guilty to that, but I think we have been working very, very hard to to combine and reduce the standards, such we're doing now with real estate core and brick schema, which fits very, very nicely together. And also, I mean, as all the job that Gabe and uh, as you also can see, Jason has done to actually make it very smooth to work with 
Haystack that has a very large install base and also the upcoming ASHRAE 223P that it will be fitting nicely. You can take the next slide, Gabe, uh, Jim. <clears throat> and this is just a little repeat and just a motivation for, as I think we've seen a couple of times earlier, but, but again, that you can see that the kind of hardcore um, technology, I mean, equipment and, 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 and devices. I don't know, Gabe, I usually make the comparison that, that uh, you can say like, if you're building a SCADA system, some sort of BMS SCADA system, I mean, then you are very, very much leaning on, on, on the kind of standard brick uh, set of definitions. If you are making a control mechanism for, an, for a compressor or something, then you would be leaning on the ASHRAE 223P. And then if you're looking at the real estate core contribution is that, okay, now we are going to make sure that we are fulfilling contracts. I mean, as we can see here in Europe, this starts to become extremely um, uh, common with uh, commercial contracts that stipulates, uh, they call it green contracts, which means that if it's very hot outside, then you are allowed to let the indoor temperature go up. And if it's very cold, you're allowed to, 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 to let them fall uh, just in order, in order to, I mean, not uh, maximize the resources. And as we said, and as we said uh, before, uh, I mean, real estate core is putting very much focus, as Carl showed on how can you model a a tenant, and a tenant has a contract that has a, uh, that is uh, consistent of a collection of um, it could be um, uh, tenant units or. Uh, it, that in their turn has a co collection of rooms, and it could be other parts. And then how you can put a start and a stop date, and you can put other kind of contractual constraints. I know that when we've been working with uh, hospitals or healthcare centers, it has been really hard constraints about airflows. So when you are adding some sort of application uh, for for um, using using AI for indoor air quality versus energy, you are not allowed to drop below some certain levels of airflow because of hygienic factor. And those kind of things could be very easily uh, controlled and making sure that you're fulfilling your requirements when you are modeling, also taking in the tenants and the contracts and the agreements. You can take the next one, Jim. And <clears throat> With this slide, we just wanted to show where in the kind of every different standard that you can think of. If you if you're if you're looking at the Internet of Things uh, as the kind of as the kind of route, uh, you, you can see how we like to to show how how we are placing real estate core and and uh, brick schema. That it's the buildings, which then of course. Uh, which then consists of of the of the building elements, the control systems, the business processes, of course more. And in a smart city, you have the energy grids, uh, you have water supplies and water and and, and, and wastewater management, etc. You have um, public transportation, etc. You have very many different domains that consist of a smart of, of, of a smart city, and in terms. I mean, you have other things than smart cities, like you have medical, agriculture, etc. And how could we see that these things, uh, I mean, put them together? This is also very much about managing the kind of expectations, because we, it's not uncommon that we get in our, in our, in our <coughs> communities or in our GitHub, we get questions about, uh, I think actually we saw in the public chat here that uh, can you support and something else and how do you and how do you um, interact with with those different parts? But this is a way of kind of setting the expectations that we are trying to solve the uh, we are not trying to solve the grid problem. We are of course working with with, with other friends in the in in the smart city community. That are that are working uh, on that part, but then we're trying to make sure that 
the when they want to when the energy grid wants to uh, to request that that the, that the building uh, relaxes the use of energy then that they can talk to each other and that brings me to the upper right corner of this image and that is a little bit about how we are seeing the kind of stack that we have uh, that we are trying to see that we will have lots of devices that could be traditional air handling units, but it could of course also be an electrical car or 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 some sort of uh, waste uh, waste bin that could that could communicate the uh, the level of the level of uh, of waste in it, and that you also see that you can. Uh, export i mean you 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 can you can you, you can expose the data uh over over apis and in the real estate core i mean real estate core has a standardized api such as haystack and as, as jason said and i mean we are working quite much on trying to also streamline these as well in order to achieve plug and play portability more and more uh, and I think uh, the other parts uh, go go for it. And I think maybe for all of you that are listening, I mean, both Brick, Rec, Haystack, and our um, uh, among others are, uh, are are published under very permissive open source licenses. So it's uh, I mean, uh, and as Jason said and we said before. Um, I think maybe actually we can switch to another picture because I'm starting to say things. So Jim, if you could please change the slide. I mean, uh, we are we are uh, I mean really really happy to I mean try to assist in our different communities. I mean we both have a real estate core community and a brick schema uh, Google group, and we have been talking about how we can. Uh, how we can interconnect those more, more, uh, and intertween those more, more closer. I, I mean, we're working on that, uh, and we are also having both on the brick side and the real estate core side. I think Carl showed some parts of it, and maybe Gabe as well. I mean, there are introductions. I mean, for for how do you how do you um, how do you how do you how do you get going? Because one thing that we have identified is that. <coughs> There is, I mean, in in traditional uh, in traditional, um, uh, I mean, if you're working with semantic web tooling, it's it's, I mean, one of the of, of the critiques uh, for semantic web uh, is that it's kind of cumbersome, and I know now Carl is probably thrown in his nose, of course, and then Gabe as well. But uh, I've heard some other people that might say that it might be a little bit too 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 much to to uh, to grasp and that in i mean and, and trying to assist with that we have several guides and we have documentation and samples and trying to make this as friendly as possible for developers to use and as you can see both the guides and there are code examples um, uh, that that exist in and and it's basically of course we have our two websites and we also have our githubs and that is kind of the main interaction point you will find links to communities and other parts uh, but you you you'll find uh, quite much examples and codes and we have been working and we are working together with <coughs> also with uh, with brick uh, when it comes to procurement requirements because one question that that really comes back in our in, in, at request from from our I mean from both our users are that okay I'm going to I'm going to procure a new new system building uh, something what should I buy and I mean we are totally agnostic when it comes to when it comes to if it should be what brand of uh, flavor of PLCs or BMS systems you should have uh, but I mean but on the other hand we try to help and say that make sure that they are following of course real estate core brick brick schema standards and and think about those things uh, and i had this is my last slide before we're moving on i had first prepared you know one of those really colorful uh, slides with all the logo types but i but I, I skipped that one but i but i think it's it's worth mentioning that we are 
we are we have quite we have quite uh, good or massive backup from from many industrial heavyweights. I mean, as as uh, um, as Carl that comes from Microsoft, Microsoft is in is uh, is implementing and has been a great support in developing real estate core and and and, and also brick schema and also many of the big <clears throat> big bms systems such as snyder uh, johnson control uh, has also been working very very closely in in uh, in order to i mean incorporate support not only smaller company jason such as such as map or such as my company property goals but uh, uh, majority also a couple of mid-sized player both when it comes to ventilation and, and lightning systems i think we had some questions in the public chat here about lightning control systems and and i think that we could probably direct uh, direct you to see how those have been used real estate core brick for model and solving solving lots of problems uh, well but uh, i'll i'll stop there and i'll uh, i mean we are a little little bit ahead of time but i'll stop here and i'll uh, let the word back to to jim thank you yeah thanks eric that was awesome and i forgot to say thanks to jason as well for an excellent presentation so we are a little bit ahead of time but it's not really an issue is it we can just um answer questions until um, there are no more questions, <laughs> or at least until we hit the time, what, whatever comes first. Um, and in terms of people that we have here that you can ask questions of, you know, obviously we've got all the people that have presented um, and some others as well. So, you know, there's some, um, you know, there's, um, I would encourage people to ask questions. You're not going to get another opportunity, I don't think, for a while to have all of these people hanging on your every word so um let's take one first of all um <clears throat> from the public chat i see actually some questions have already been answered so that's pretty awesome thanks a lot for doing that guys uh but one here i know someone asked a question to gabriel and carl please elaborate on the temporal dimension of the spatial and administrative parts of the model during the q a if possible that is partly the core of what we ourselves do based on rec, uh, rec brick today and it would be interesting to hear more about different approaches gabe carl what do you think yeah so this is a tricky one since it since the question explicitly is about the spatial administrative parts i, I get the feeling it touches more towards the rec side of the fence uh, but of course the same thing is conceptually applicable also to to brick so basically when you're building a knowledge graph or any really if you're building an ontology or any type of data schema that needs to be temporally indexed basically all of the uh, phenomena all the classes and relationships inside of that ontology or that schema need to take temporal in indexing into account and there's an immediate trade-off then between having a cognitively relevant and you know lightweight, easy to use, easy to read, easy to understand model on the one hand, and having one which is expressive enough to support temporal indexing of everything. And so we do not, yeah, at least in real estate core, we do not have, as I mentioned in the chat, support for temporal representations on anything other than the event uh, class, which is explicitly a temporal thing, which starts and ends with, with timestamps. But things like um when was this wall put here in uh, and when was it removed that is not something that is supported by real estate core and if you wanted to add that kind of support um basically we'd have to it would rejig how we think about everything it would be deep enough to basically refactor everything from the very ground up and I, and i think the result would be difficult to parse and interpret i would propose therefore that as i think also in the chat that since time indexing is useful in some scenarios but not in others sometimes you just want the right now state sometimes the state is changing slowly enough that your change management processes can accommodate this um 
in if you have that use case i would propose that you set up a a state keeping mechanism that lives in parallel with your knowledge graph uh, and allows you to load up the knowledge graph at any given point in time to see what was the state like then and you would have something like callbacks upon every update to your graph through whatever api you use that would update the state in said uh in said uh, timekeeping platform i know for instance that if you're using azure digital twins to store your knowledge graph then there is a, a built-in connector through to azure data explorer that allows you to uh, keep track of all the graph updates in azure data explorer um, but that's just one product of course there are many uh, in this space um gabe what would you say yeah i mean it's <clears throat> The question of managing uh, uh, temporal information depends heavily on what you need to use that temporal information for. Um, you can go very, very deep in the academic literature, not even just on knowledge graphs, just on relational databases. Richard T. Snodgrass published a bunch of stuff in the 80s and 90s on this. Um, where, I mean, like, is it the time where the wall was? Uh, you know, they decided to put the wall in when it was started to be framed, when it was finished, when it was added to the model. So there's many different flavors of these timestamps as well. Um, and I think we've 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 rightfully sort of shied away from trying to tell people how how to do that. Um, I think Carl's answer was excellent. A few things that I would add. Um, so in in Brick two two three P and uh, this would generalize for real estate core as well. We have this notion of an external reference, which is a basically a foreign key or a pointer to information that's stored in some other database. So for Brick, we have oh, well, here's my temperature sensor associated with my VAV box. I could have an external reference that points to a backnet object in a network somewhere. It could also point to um, a work order. It could also point to a um, an entry in some sort of temporal store that keeps track of the valid time or the time where that entity existed. Um, things that you have to worry about um, is what, uh, uh, what 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 makes the entity the thing that it is. Uh, the example that I that I give is you imagine a temperature sensor in a conference room, right? I might call that the conference room temperature sensor. Um, at some point later, I decide, you know, I'm I'm remodeling. I'm going to turn that conference room into two offices, and now the temperature sensor is in Office B. Now, if I care about the role that that temperature sensor serves, I probably care about renaming it to Sensor B for the remodel. But if I care about tracking the physical identity of the actual transducer, so I can do things like track sensor drift, I actually care about the physical identity of that, right? So. The question of like naming and as these things evolve, it's not actually obvious how to do that. Um, we uh, we have some support in in the Brick Schema Python package for versioning graphs. Really, just sort of a transaction logs. You can check out the version of your model at a prior time. Um, there is 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 some support in sort of these bi-temporal graph databases, things like Terminus or XTDB that will support queries like this. Um, but, you know, and this brings in other elements of like, are you interested in point in time queries? I want to figure out what did the building look like on this day? Or am I interested in range queries where I'm interested in looking at the set of things that existed in a space over a point in time? So um, as these use cases get more concrete, I think it makes sense for us to try to centralize on something. But as um, as it stands today, the the. Uh, it's still fairly broad of of what you might actually want to use that for. So I would encourage you definitely engage with us, talk with us about what you're doing with time, what you need to model time for, um, what are those use cases, and maybe there's something that we can all arrive at uh, together. Uh, the one thing I can, I can just add, just one one short thing. I mean, if when when I, I saw the question, and if I'm reading it, I mean. The way that we uh, have implemented it in an application in, in the protocols application is that we are basically tracking the changes to the digital twin in a github style manner uh, so, and you can also do it over api so you can track changes and see the timestamps 
And then you're solving the kind of, I can keep track of over how a building has changed. And I can see what was the state of the digital twin at, the, at, at a given point that you can put together. That is just one little small, small part of the much broader. I mean, we have been discussing it quite much with how to handle different time series and, and changes. But for specifically for moving a wall, how you can keep track of how you can keep track of that one. Yeah. Sorry, Eric. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing I would add, and I know that this has been now three people kind of saying, well, this is really hard. And here's all the reasons that we don't want to do this. Uh, and, and my answer, unfortunately, continues that this is really hard. And uh, here's kind of why we don't want to do this. One thing I would say about kind of temporal data is that you usually get some help from your, your database management server as part of that, right? Not doesn't try to put everything into the data model. You instead kind of make some assumptions that the server is going to help you out uh, and do some translation under the covers uh, to make the make the temporal query uh, a little more sensible. So you can just talk about, here's my building, and then you put sort of in the query itself, um, you know, I want to see how it existed at this point in time that you didn't actually have to deal too much in the data modeling part of it. The service is kind of managing that uh, automatically for it. And under the covers, it's doing all sorts of work. Um, we have a little bit of a philosophy in Brick of trying to avoid making too many assumptions about what the server can do um, and sort of sticking purely to the RDF and the Sparkle and can, can any uh, service system kind of handle that uh, and be portable. And it would get a lot easier if we said, okay, we're going to say we're going to use this particular server, but then that I think makes, uh, makes it more difficult to use Brick in a broad manner. So, um, you know, we'll continue to watch and I think uh, brick is not the only, you know, the building domain is not the only kind of knowledge graph thing that needs uh, good support for temporal um, uh, data management. And hopefully we'll see as more standards come out. So this has been four unsatisfying answers uh, in a row here. Uh, but I think the answer is that there isn't a great answer uh, without either polluting basically um, all queries that you're going to run that now all have to know about uh, uh, data stuff or to have a simplified manner and do this do the obvious thing uh if if you if you say nothing about um what time you want in your query you should just assume now but if you want something else um you know that's just that's just tough to do with the current query systems um so it's kind of if you ask if you want to be able to track time you've got to always talk about time when you're uh talking about it and if you don't want to talk about time then it's real easy but if, as soon as you add that in there, it just complicates everything. And there's no good kind of system to, to hide that from you yet. So. All right. <clears throat> Thank you for those four unsatisfactory answers. <laughs> OK, let's, um, let's move on. There's a question here from Alexandra. Uh, is there any recommended quick way to convert from older versions of REC to the newest one? Uh, and there's some points here from uh, the use case. Um, how would you recommend to address this? Um, so in the chat, you can see more. So I don't know, uh, Eric, uh, Carl, do you want to take this? Yeah, I guess uh, I, I should say from, from an ontology engineering point of view, when we built Real Estate Core 4, that was uh, designated a breaking change. So we had to break things, uh, I would say. Well, didn't have to, but we elected to, among other things, for the pur purpose of aligning closer to to brick and to other models and to clean up uh, old stuff. So there are some changes there for sure. Um, if I recall correctly, the spatial model is not too much changed, nor the agent model not too much changed, though it is some time since we did this release. But of course, the things that touch upon on things like points and equipment and so forth, where brick comes in is substantially changed. Um, it was never intended to be a backwards compatible release. And as such, I don't have a good w design answer for this. Uh, Eric, I know, uh, Valin, that is, I know your company is in a similar situation that you've also supported both versions. Could you talk to how you've, uh, or how you're uh, attacking this? yeah no i mean <clears throat> i mean we are we are uh i don't think 
I don't have the exact knowledge in detail, but I mean, we are we are always striving for being backward compatible. I think we're actually backward compatible to 2.3. Since the API um, stipulates that you are informing about what version it is, which means that when you get a request over um, over 4.4.1, and uh, or if if you get a request from the API for uh, three or four four over uh, uh, over three, then we have made a small converter. So we make sure so we have made the kind of alignment. But because as Carl said, it it isn't that hard in the sense that we it's more that we have using the brick uh, ERIs and, and the brick identifiers in real estate core and of course we have changed some parts when it comes to equipment and points but uh, overall it's uh, now i'm trying to now i'm painting it painting it very 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 brighter but it's uh, um, it, it, it 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 is not uh, and that means that i mean but that doesn't help you i mean if, if you want as i read your question that that you want that you have a source system in 3.3 i mean some legacy system and then you start to building applications on the on on, on the 1.4 4.1 version. Uh, uh, I would probably, <clears throat> you know, you have to you have to um, solve that. I could I could uh, we could put this up in the community, and then I could put you into contact with 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 some developer that has actually done this instead of me trying to um, to as you say in Swedish kill Yisa. That is like boys guessing. Uh, I should try to stick to facts. So I'll, I'll stop there. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, and I, I suppose one sort of, uh, one good thing in this scenario, uh, uh, well, is that we have the API definition. So if we were just doing a, an ontology and saying we're moving from one version of the ontology to another version of the ontology, and we also changed the canonical representation language from OWL to Shackle and DTDL in this uh, route, you would be pretty much out of, of luck entirely and had to write a whole bunch of code. In this case, we do have the fact that we've designed an API that follows the definitions of the ontology. So there's a Swagger API for three and there's a Swagger API for four. So simply getting data out as JSON objects uh, is uh, reasonably simple. Uh, and then you'd have to do translation, but some of that plumbing and piping is, is so to speak, uh, already there, as opposed to the scenario where we just provided the models, where you'd have to also add said plumbing and piping, plumbing and piping. Um, but yeah, sorry, that's a, a trickier challenge. Uh, Gabe uh, and, and Jason and Eric Paulson, for that matter, how do you think about backwards compatibility in in uh, in brick going forward? When you hit a breaking required breaking change at some point. I think, could be, I think this is an in interesting discussion to have more broadly as well. What's the recommended practices there? Yeah, so we try so we try to avoid it, right? Where we where we can. Um, the the deprecations we have we have a few relationships in in Brick that relate to deprecations. This is the most common form of uh, uh, backwards incompatibility, right? Is is removing a concept but after you know. We used to call outdoor fans fresh air fans, um, but if you're living in anywhere where there's fires, you know that's not necessarily true. It's better to be precise. Um, so there's a collection of these backwards compatible issues which can be solved more or less in an automated fashion. Um, and that's what we try to do with our, our, our deprecation piece. It's like you're using fresh air fan, let's replace that with an outdoor fan, or you're using brick building, let's replace that with real estate core building. Um, for, for those, you know, we, we, we raise what's called a, a, a shackle warning, so it doesn't fail your validation, but it does show up in the, in the output. Um, so I do think that validation has, has a role in this, in, um, uh, validation has a role in, in how to evolve these ontologies and, and moving those forward. And so it's important to be able to check uh, what's going on. Uh, for those changes that are not backwards compatible, our goal is to at least be able to ex identify the um, backwards incompatible elements in existing models. Um, so we should be able to identify that. You're using a concept that doesn't exist. 
and there is no equivalent. So you need to figure out another way of modeling that, or um, these two things cannot be related in this way, or uh, you're using a modeling construct that is that is too old and invalid. So we we our priority is to be able to uh, first identify anything that is a backwards incompatible um, a, a usage of the ontology, repair it where we can, and if we, but if we can't repair it, at least let you know um, explicitly in the output uh, how to handle that. Yeah, but, give the, go ahead, sir. No, I was gonna give an exact example. Uh, a lot of times we can automatically repair it, sometimes we can't because we are now making something more precise uh, and we require maybe more information about it. And I'll use one kind of silly example uh, as part of the brick to real estate core deprecation, uh, Brick had a cubicle as a space type. Um, and, you know, is that a space? Is it not a space? Well, um, you know, you can argue either way. Your manager probably says, yeah, it's a, it's a space. Uh, and, you know, if you sit in one, you're probably like, no, this is not a space. Uh, and in real estate core, there is no cubicle space. Um, and so in Brick, when we deprecate it, we're, you know, the, the explanation we have to say is like, well, you, you can't do this. Uh, directly, what you now need to sort of do is say that you wanted to find there is, there is a little equivalent of a zone, and I'll actually forget exactly what it is, but you can define, you know, an area that if you want to have a corresponding, like, you know, here is your I mean, uh, two meter by two meter space, right? you can still define that as a space, and then you can put a desk in it. And so like, that's how you now replace a cubicle. It's, it's, it's this, there's a very clearly spatial component, which nests properly and everything. And then there's a and then there's a piece of furniture. And that is what a cubicle is. And we can't automatically repair that for you because we don't necessarily know kind of how that spatial component works. And we could make a furniture for you. I guess that'd be easy enough, but um, but that then loses all the spatial componentness of it. And, and so that's what we just kind of have to flag. And so that's where I think a lot of our incompatibilities can come. It's not like we're gonna have things like, oh, there is no longer such a thing as a VAV box. They've all been uh, packed up and uh, tossed into the sun. Like there will always be something like that. There always, um, it's not quite that things are going to disappear. It's just that we're going to refine it in such a way that in order to automate the repair, we would need some additional information from, and we can just identify that and tell you, here's what we need that new information for. I, the other piece of, of context I'd, I'd provide here is these things are emerging because we're doing fundamentally new things with ontologies, at least in my experience. Many existing ontologies are sort of handed down from the mountain, right? Um, after the committee has discussed and they've argued, and and now this perfect thing comes out, and it's 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 the RDFS ontology or it's this ontology. And what we're doing in brick and real estate core is is really something quite different, which is the the fact that uh, the idea that the domain can actually change, um, and we want to name concepts that are useful enough to people that. They actually have to reflect the patterns of industry um, and emerging use cases. So, um, I, you know, and, and and in that, in in this sort of software development uh, attitude towards ontology development, uh, it really does require people from the community to to come forward and let us know what's actually like to develop real software with these. Right? I have my own things that I'm developing. But I'm also working on the ontology. So for people that are building products on top of this or seeking to use it, um, let us know what your pain points are. Um, and 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 there maybe there's things that we can do uh, together. Maybe there's opportunities for new products or approaches um, to smooth over some of these difficulties. But I don't think this is a problem that the ontology knowledge graph community has solved before because it is the idea that you could deprecate an idea in a knowledge graph is 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 not something that is uh, very well supported or really talked about. Um, so we're, we're, we're trying something really new here. So um, help us out. Um, we'd love to help you. Uh, sorry for keep, keep beating on a dead horse here or keep continuing this thread. But yeah, I, I, this brings to mind, I think also the advantage of these ontologies over you know, some uh, prior attempts in similar domains, which is exactly that these are uh, battle tested by developers to build software solutions off of. Uh, and, and so with that comes the fact that, well, we're going to have to evolve the models in parity with whatever software we are supporting or software use cases that we are supporting, not necessarily individual softwares, obviously, 
Um, and, and that brings with it new pain points and new challenges. So elegantly capture there, Gabe, because I think some of the earlier ones, uh, earlier examples are very nice ontologies for by ontology engineers for ontology engineers, and that's not quite what we are. Um, on that note, actually, I'm gonna, Jim, I'm gonna take over and uh, check the next question because it refers to a piece of work I'm very familiar with, which is okay. uh, the modular ontology modeling methodology. It's a brilliant, brilliant ontology modeling uh, methodology. And I say so because I co-authored the paper about it. Um, uh, so um, the question is about how this methodology works with brick and real estate core and commodity, uh, which is a, a tooling that we built to support the modular ontology modeling methodology. And, and I think there's this touches upon actually what we were just discussing. So the idea there with those tools, and I still think they have a lot of utility, is that we want to simplify ontology modeling. We want to bring ontology modeling to the masses. And the idea was that, okay, let's build a tool, which is a plugin for the protege ontology engineering environment, where you just drag and drop components and they stick together like Legos. And you'd have to define what are those components? What are those design patterns? What's an appropriate scope for them uh, in terms of, of, of size, in terms of complexity? What's the boundaries, the snapping in points, if you will, to other things. How do we represent those interfaces, that interconnectivity in a way that is uh, generic enough, yet usable enough? So trying to bridge the gap here between ontology engineering and, and ontology practice. And so Real Estate Core 3 and earlier were modular in part because of these ideals. The modules there were relatively large modules. They were more like subdomain type modules rather than design pattern based modules, but it originally comes from that idea. Um, I would say at, at this moment, uh, the, the, uh, the methodology still holds. Um, it is more applicable, I think, to comparatively smaller uh, models and ontologies that we're speaking of. Not necessarily because the methodology is poor, but because the supporting tooling, commodity, uh, as mentioned in the question, was a research type prototype based on top of Protege, which, I mean, I love Protege as an ontology engineer. I think it's a great tool for an ontology engineer, but I think it is fair to say that it's not a tool that targets the software developer group uh, as such. Uh, and so I think maybe one thing we've learned, and I, I would like to applaud our colleagues on the brick side here of, of the use of, of Python as a representation for to bring uh, ontology engineering closer to the devs. So the source of brick is in Python and you compile the turtle from that. I think we on Real Estate Core learned the same that the underlying representation languages, OWL, uh, is a bit complex. So we shifted to using DTDL, the Digital Twin Definition Language, as the primary representation language, which strikes a very nice balance between expressivity and, and uh, usability and ease of use. Um, so I think that's one challenge that ontology languages and ontology methods have, is that the languages are too complex, too complicated for people. And the tools, because they need to support the full expressivity of those complex languages, are also too complicated. Uh, I would like to see simpler tools doing fewer things, but doing them better. Uh, but exactly where to strike the balance on that, that's a tough challenge, uh, certainly. I mean, that is a full-blown research career, essentially, <laughs> not just a research project. Uh, so coming back to the question then, how does this work? Well, there is a historical connection between the methodology mentioned, and I will recommend you guys read the paper because I know I'm biased, but it's I think it's a nice paper uh, on modular ontology modeling. Um, if you want to look into the commodity tool, do do that, but be aware that it was a research prototype and has not been updated for 12 to 18 months at this point, uh, and that's a lot of time in this space. So sorry for rambling, but any. Uh, any reflections on that from the other panel members? Don't think so. Or maybe Gabe. No. Okay. Well, um, if that was the last question I can see at the moment, but 
So now would be a great opportunity for someone to chip in with a fine uh, with some more questions. We have we have time. Yeah. So I'd actually like to go back and just touch the briefly touch on there was a BIM question very early on, which I think sure. Gabe addressed, but I wanted to just elaborate a little bit more on yeah, that. Yeah, go for it. Um, uh, just kind of two quick thoughts. Um, one one thing we have been doing in Brick uh, is when we are trying to put some stuff together, we do try to look at uh, other data sources, and we've been sticking with Ashra. We've looked actually at uh, OmniClass as a source for like what's the what's the types, uh, how do they fit together? Um, you know, we try not to reinvent the wheel um, if we if we can't and if if we don't have to. Um, and so I'm going to stop my video because it's telling me I've got an unstable connection. Um, the um, the other thing that we are exploring is um, being able to just add additional classification types just as you know a new property um, so um, if you want to use uh, uni class or uh, your own uh, bim classification system um, that we have a nice easy way to map between that um, you know so all the brick classes have a corresponding entry in uni class or something and so um, it's straightforward for us to either um, Take a BIM, take the assets from a BIM model and uh, assign appropriate brick types to them kind of automatically, uh, or go the other way around if you've got a brick model and you need to just dump out a make a Kobe file or something uh, that we got some kind of start for that. We can do that. Um, the other thing I'm just going to pitch is that um, this summer, um, this past summer, um, there was a student uh, in the Google Summer of Code uh, work who uh, spent some time working with IFC OpenShell and the Blender BIM add-in to do um, uh, brick and some real estate core work um, in the IFC utility world. And so the Blender BIM um, uh, project is a, a set of add-ons to Blender, which uh, brings basically a, a BIM and IFC uh, authoring environment. Uh, so you can design your building and you see it visualized in brick, but natively it's managing um, uh, uh, the IFC data structures under underneath the covers, um, and there was uh, the student did support in uh, being able to add uh, brick mappings to those IFC files, uh, and so you can create uh, you can import a brick model into Blender BIM and connect it to the BIM entries, and uh, if you've got a IFC model, you can create um, you can click on the different BIM entries and, and create brick classes from that, and so you have a have a linkage. Um, uh, for that. And I think that we are broadly very interested in um, thinking about how to uh, better connect uh, BIM and uh, BRIC um, uh, in uh, bringing those parts of the life cycle together so we can uh, be more involved in uh, uh, creating the uh, the IoT and, and kind of operational side of things uh, earlier on. So using the BIM models and at the design phase to then better inform and better translate direct to the operational phase. Uh, Cause you can do all sorts of cool stuff. You can do all sorts of cool simulation work. You can do all sorts of great work before any shovels go into the ground and try out things. And not only that, but there should be a path and this is part of the ASHRAE 223 and 231 plan and, open, uh, and the controls description language of a grand vision of um, there's no manual work, right? Once we sort of do that design work and we create all the HVAC controls uh, that's all that configuration is maintained uh, through the design phase, through the construction phase, through the operation phase, and humans don't have to type it all back in. So you get the best practices uh, that are specified. The whole thing lives digitally uh, and it's simulated, and then that's just blasted right on your control system exactly as the design engineers created it in the commissioning steps, the uh, programming steps, all that is reduced so it's faster and there's less errors. Um, and. And so I think it's a really exciting space for the um, the built environment over the next couple of years to sort of make that workflow go and imagining someone sets the design uh, at the very beginning and then no one ever does anything other than click on copy data. Um, and it's all just automatically handled through each steps here uh, and, and put on. And I think it'll be a really exciting uh, uh, and time saving and make a lot, uh, just make things just a lot better. Great. Thanks, Eric. Yes, Gabe, I was going to mention that um, next week, if anyone's going <clears throat> to AHR, I believe both uh, Eric W, Eric Willine and Gabe are going to be there. And uh, you're going to be, what's this, Seminar 55. So you're going to be talking about some of those concepts.
Yes, we'll be talking about the emerging ASHRAE 223P standard, <clears throat> semantic models, and the ASHRAE 231 standard, the control description language, um, and how these can uh, enable digital delivery of analytics and controls in buildings. Um, and the one other thing I would add to, to Eric's work, there's also um, some work going on at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, one of the other national labs in the U.S. on using um, uh, importing data from Revit models. So it's not just IFC. If you're stuck, um, uh, if you're using Revit, um, uh, there's some really nice open source tools coming out that that uh, 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 PNNL folks are, are developing translators to to do through P and Brick from those as well. So we're getting closer to the BIM world. Great, that's good to hear. So I only have sort of about five minutes left. Um, so, you know, I guess maybe this is uh, a good opportunity as we've covered all the questions, guys, to wrap up. Um, if you have some fi final thoughts, um, now would be the time to share them. Um, so, yeah, anyone want to take that opportunity? Well, nothing other than to say it's been a, a lovely collaboration. I've really appreciated working with the uh, BRIC colleagues, uh, Gabe, Jason, Eric, um, and others, uh, not Frontier, to, to, to bring this to the next level and to actually reduce the clutter in this space a little bit by homogenizing how we do things. So not only is the result nice, but from a collaboration point of view, it is, uh, has been uh, very nice also and i strongly urge any participants on this call or viewers on this video too to link up and be part of this work because this these are community efforts so uh there are some companies that depend on this there are some companies that sponsor part of this there are some grants that sponsor part of this work but it's also a fair amount of, of uh, people doing things they're interested in because they want to help out so anything we can get you on interested in do reach out and do join yeah, hundred <clears throat> percent. Obviously, we want, you want people to collaborate. And uh, there we go. There are some resource links for those that do want to uh, collaborate. Uh, yeah, I just you know get in touch with us. Um, we're more than happy to walk you through things. Uh, these standards uh, change and evolve because of things that people have said to us and reached out and and let us know, um, you know what the, what their needs are. Um, so yes, it's been fantastic to work with the real estate core folks. It's it's really refreshing to have, um, you know, two organizations that are willing to seed ground to each other for the sake of moving things forward. Um, no one, you know, not one of us just has to eat the the whole world. And of course, building on RDF and all the rest of it makes it makes it much easier to do too. Um, the last thing I'll mention. Um, so uh, so we'll be at at, at AHR. Um, we're going to try to. I know. They changed us from our usual location in downtown, which there's plenty of places to go and hang out. Um, but I think the the evening of the 23rd, we're going to go uh, and try and meet up somewhere, um, you know, buy a couple of pictures. And if you want to come and talk to us about anything, um, please, please come to do that. Um, keep an eye on the uh, Google groups and the Gitter uh, up above uh, for an announcement of, of uh, when and where that'll be taking place. But uh, we'd love to see you uh, in Chicago. Uh, as well as online in all our our, our uh, communities. Yeah, and and just adding to that, I think when we are posting the the recording of this and we are sending out to I mean all of you, then Gabe, as, as soon as we as soon as we know a little bit better about the, the location, but it will be the evening on the twenty third in in Chicago, and it seems like you should bring a rain an umbrella uh, <laughs> next week. <clears throat> Good stuff. All right. Well, of course, um, thanks everybody for joining. Thanks for listening. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't think there's anything more to say other than, uh, again, thanks to all the guys here, both Eric's, Gabe, Jason, Carl for contributing and uh, some really interesting presentations. And of course, um, you know, we'll be following up with links to the, uh, to the recording and uh, you've seen all the links already to all of the resources so and that's it thanks you thanks jim of course moderation. moderation and martin other people are behind the scene martin and matthias and other guys behind the scene thank you guys for producing this <clears throat> good stuff we'll say bye then thanks have a, a good good evening or good morning or wherever you are in the world
to you guys. All right. Bye-bye.